Hello, welcome back to my channel. And as you can see, I still need a haircut. Kids are coming back to school officially now though. So since I won't be like seeing that many people at work, uh, I may shave the head just to get this whole thing over with. And then I won't have to pay for a fucking haircut. Perfect, right? Anyways, we got lots of stuff to talk about right now. Um, so I'm just gonna get right into it. Cause like I said, my phone's filling up with mystery usage somehow that I'm not even adding to it. And uh, it doesn't like to cooperate with the space. So I've been up to a bunch of stuff lately. First three things here are books. So let's get right into them. First one up is the third, I think the third. Yeah, book three in the Dragon Watch series called Master of the Phantom Isle. So in this book, um, Seth, uh, Kendra's brother Seth, uh, co- uh, caretaker of the Worm Roost uh, Dragon Sanctuary has lost his memories after their last adventure, and so he's been taken under sway of Ronadin, the the dark unicorn. When the the siblings got separated at the end of the last adventure, um, so he's he's Ronadin is swaying Seth to do certain things because Seth has the ability to um, uh, speak with dark presence and stuff his abilities border on the dark even though he's not a dark or evil person his abilities lie in that realm so ronan is kind of steering him to do some some of his evil biddings and the first thing he has him do is is uh go to a prison and release a bunch of wraiths and demons and spirits and stuff like that and it just so happens that the uh, the location where of this prison where he does so is at Wormroost Sanctuary and basically with Celebrant the Dragon King um, waging uh, announcing war on the humans in the sanctuaries uh, wanting the, the dragon's freedom um, this is the last step in 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 kind of making that plan come to fruition at Wormroost is releasing this these wraiths which basically force all the humans and, and stuff to flee Wormroost and the sanctuary falls um so Kendra and all of her allies end up going to Crescent um Lagoon I think it's called which is another sanctuary far far away and it's out in the ocean most of it is underwater actually and uh it had recently fallen but they'd gained the 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 keepers there had gained a foothold in getting it back under control um so Kendra and her allies go there because what lies there if they can help recover the sanctuary um and and deal with the mer people and all that sort of thing they can find a way to possibly get seth his memories back and, and get him back from ronad and 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 uh get him back onto the right side so they go about this meanwhile seth is still working for ronad and he's made a deal with the under king who uh, lords over all of the undead um, and and is kind of bound to him by a, by an agreement they come to and so he's trying to work this thing off and and by doing so he's doing more harm for Ronadin. Um, Seth or Kendra and and everybody in Tanu and all those guys though they end up having success at Crescent Lagoon and it all adds up to Kendra going on a solo mission to the Phantom Isle where Ronadin and his headquarters are uh where he's keeping seth in an effort to recover her brother and get his memories back and also recover her boyfriend bracken the not dark unicorn uh who seth has actually met in prison on the phantom isle and uh bracken was the first one who kind of swayed seth into thinking maybe i'm not doing the right thing maybe this ronin guy is really an asshole and he's he's tricking me right seth just doesn't know because he's lost all his memories he doesn't know who he is what he does um and, and what everything means so um so it all leads to the phantom isle uh in in one last adventure where everything clashes and stuff so i think I don't, i'm not sure how many books he's doing in this usually he does around five so uh there might be a couple left but uh i've got the fourth one on my list but i it's just not out in in paperback yet so but it will eventually hit my shelf next up leia princess of alderaan this is kind of like a Leia, 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 Leia prequel story. Like it, it, it starts off when she's 16 years old. She's just uh, about to go through this ceremony with her parents on Alderaan that basically announced she's an adult and she is going to be 
uh, claiming her right to become the next Queen of Alderaan uh, when she comes of age. And uh, in order for her to do that successfully, she has to go through these three trials, uh, heart, mind, whatever, something like that. So basically one of them, she becomes a junior legislator, uh, uh, senatorial, whatever, in the Galactic Senate. Um, one of them, she um, wants to climb Mount Alderaan or something like that. There's a physical challenge. And then the other one is she joins a Pathfinder group. And uh, in this Pathfinder group, she comes across Amy Lynn Holdo, uh, a young Amy Lynn. And that's the, it, this is cool because this shows kind of the basis and the start of their friendship. And as we know, Amy Lynn uh, sacrificed herself in The Last Jedi, I think it was, when she ran that Star Destroyer through with her ship. Um, and uh, also in this group is a is another Alderan Alderanian senator, uh, junior senator named Kira Domati, who Leia eventually develops a romantic relationship with um so she's finding though leia that her parents don't have time for her anymore and she's feeling really ignored so she tries to do, do something good and goes to this planet called wobani on a um uh, a mission of aid and uh she sees how bad the conditions are and she tricks an imperial officer into letting her take a bunch of the people off planet and back to alderaan as as new hires to their crew and stuff. Um, when she gets back, her parents are mad at her because they were like, we had it in place that we were gonna free that planet, but now you've ruined it because you made the Imperial officer there look stupid and they're not gonna let this go through anymore. So um, so she feels even worse now that she's made this mistake and her parents are mad at her now. Um, so eventually, as she spends time on Coruscant doing the junior senator thing, and uh, she goes through her pathfinding missions with her new friends, um, she eventually uh, starts digging and stuff and finds mention of a planet named Crate, um, which which raises some suspicions. So she flies there um, and finds that uh, her father uh, is leading some sort of a rebel alliance <laughs> against the Empire. And she wants in, but her parents won't let her get involved because they fear for her safety. They want her in the dark so that if they get found out, she won't be harmed, even though she will be right um so she over the next little while she presses and presses her parents to to let her in on this and even though they won't she takes matters into her own hands and starts doing other things and and eavesdropping and doing all these other missions um to try and discover her own information and eventually grand moff tarkin uh they think he has suspicions that 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 the organas are, are leading some sort of movement and uh, one day he mentions to Leia about a certain planet um, that, that, that he's aware of and she just happens to find and, and deep in some files that uh, the, Re the Rebel Alliance her parents are leading, their fleet is stationed there and she's like, he knows. So then the end of the story is basically her and Amy Lynn on a desperate last uh, minute mission to get to this uh, system and warn her father that Tarkin's on to you. The Empire's going to be here any minute. You've got to get out of here sort of thing. So it's kind of a race to save the rebel fleet uh, before it can be destroyed uh, by Tarkin and his Imperial goons. So really cool story. Like I said, it brought in a lot of things like Amy Lynn Hold over the start of their relationship. It brought in kind of how she was in the Senate and knew Tarkin and knew some other people in there. Uh, it mentions Saw Guerrera and his uh, partisan forces um when when her she goes to Naboo actually um where her mother was from and uh and Captain Panaka from back in the uh first couple of movies in the prequel trilogy he's now a moth for the empire and he ends up getting killed by Saw's forces so there's all these little tie-ins from past present and 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 uh within the whole movie kind of uh sequence there so it's it's a really cool book and uh um, I hope they do more like this where they kind of delve into a character's kind of early years just to fill in the gaps, right? Next up, book 13, I believe it is. I think it's 13. Yeah. Skullduggery Pleasant, Seasons of War. In this book, um, the main part of the story is that uh, there's this alternate dimension <clears throat> that, that came about in the last book or maybe the last two books. 
um, where there's a, it's called they call it the Leibniz universe or something like that where there's it's it's basically the same uh, people are in it but it's just a way different uh, things didn't evolve in that universe the way it did in this universe so it's a little more primitive but all the same characters are, are there there's a Skullduggery there's a Valkyrie there's a Mevolent there's a, um, Nefarian Serpine like all the same players are in both universes and so Skullduggery and Valkyrie in their investigations find out that Mevolent, uh, the supremely evil being um, of, of the Lydna's universe, is planning on uh, raiding their own universe and bringing his armies over um, from the Lydna's universe because there is some sort of zombie sickness going on over there that's, that's uh, killing everybody off and stuff. So he's got to get out of that universe and he's planning on coming over to theirs and uh, basically enslaving everybody and becoming its master. So... Um, China, the Grand Mage, uh, asks Skullduggery and Valkyrie to go over to that universe and kill Mevolent and stop this thing before it can even happen. So it's Skullduggery, Valkyrie, Tanith Lowe, two of the original dead men in uh, Dexter Vex and Saris and Rue, as well as Nefarian Serpine from the Libanese universe who had come over and was hiding in, in their universe. Um, and he's a he's a really bad dude. He was the main villain from like the very first book, um, so uh, he has insider info of that universe though. So they take him along, as well as a shunter who gets them over there, and he goes by the name of Luke Skywalker. <laughs> Funnily enough, um, so they go over there and basically try to kill Mevolent, and there's all sorts of left turns and right turns and back backups and stuff along the way, and. And uh, they meet with a lot of resistance. They lose one of their numbers, actually a couple of their numbers, and uh, and and it's uh, a real kind of mess in the end that they get themselves into as the war finally does spill out into their own uh, universe and and uh, and threatens to to ruin it. So, and and while all this is going on, there's two other kind of side storylines going on. <clears throat> the Darkly Brothers, who um, Augur is destined to battle the king of the dark lands for the safety of their own universe um when he comes of the age of 17 i think it is he's still only 16 or whatever so it's not supposed to happen for another year but uh in order to to prepare augur for this um omen and his friends attempt to secure the obsidian blade which is the weapon that can kill the king of the dark lands which augur is going to need so they have this whole little sequence where they're trying to obtain this blade from some bad sorcerers and uh, there's lots of danger involved and then the other side story is that Darkess uh, who was brought back from wherever they sent her back a number of books ago um, he, she, she was brought back at the end of the last book by that uh, Sebastian guy who wears the plague doctor mask and all that and uh, at first she just is non-responsive when she gets back to, to this universe and uh, so he kind of talks to her and gets her um, trying to play by what they want her to do and uh, and eventually she comes around and she has all these requests of him that she wants to do before she can deem this universe worthy of her attention or whatever so it's it's got this whole thing going on which gets kind of weird but also hilarious in the end so um, Really awesome book, awesome series. I hope it keeps on going. I don't know if this is ever going to end or not, but it's it's such a violent. It's it's a series for young readers, but there's so much violence in it um, that it's just awesome, and anybody can die. Like basically anybody can die, and they die badly. Like it's ugly, and uh, and there's just so much humor in it too. It just every situation is punctuated with a ridiculous type of humor. And, uh, and it just, uh, it just makes the book fly along. And I, I've actually tried to write a couple of small children's books, uh, myself. And I, I stylized a lot of my writing after this with the humor. I, I try to work in that same type of dry, ridiculous, uh, quirky kind of humor that, that Derek Landy puts into his Skullduggery Pleasant books, uh, because I just, it just makes me laugh so much. And I, and I, I, I even in such a dark kind of book series, to inject that kind of humor is just it makes it so it's, it's such this contrast between violence and death and and ridiculous humor right so i just i love the skullduggery pleasant series next up 
Super Mario Land for the Game Boy. This was a launch title for the original Game Boy system in 1989, and uh, and it's it's basically the same type of Mario platformer that you got on the console with some differences. One of the main differences is um, the plot line. Um, Mario is actually in a land called Sarasa Land or something like that, and uh, it's Daisy, not Peach, who is uh, kidnapped by some evil spaceman or something. I forget his name. And uh, and so you got a rescue here. So it's a typical type of Mario storyline. Um, and uh, the levels are mostly similar in style to, to the console versions. There's four different worlds with three levels each for 12 total levels. And uh, the main difference between a couple of the levels, though, is that there's like vehicle levels. And one of them you use, like I think, a submarine. And the other one, some sort of flying ship, I think, that kind of it's that scrolling sideways scrolling that it pushes you along right you have to take your enemies as they come as you're pushed along the screen sort of thing so it's it's kind of some varied gameplay there with some vehicle levels and uh yeah if you can brave the 12 levels and save daisy you have saved the day and that actually marks daisy's very first appearance in the in the mario uh universe um is in that game so which makes sense i mean um I'm not sure what year Super Mario Brothers 3 came out. I've got to figure it was probably 90 or 91, maybe. Um, so really, the only two games before this one for Mario were, was Super Mario Brothers and Super Mario Brothers 2. So um, so it's a pretty early game in the Mario series. And, and very fun and very easy enough, but still a bit challenging in places. So it, it's, a, it's a really good game. Next up, I finally finished this, and I was so pumped. Doom 3 the BFG edition. Now, when I bought this at Game Cycle for four bucks or whatever it was, um, I didn't know what the BFG edition meant, even though it had a description of something probably on here. But it not only comes with Doom 3 uh, for the PS3, but the original Doom and Doom 2 games, which uh, were basically on PC and stuff way back in the day. So Doom, the original Doom, uh, was released in 93. And I played it a ton in like 95, 96 when I was in my first year of university uh, up in my dorm room. I'd be sitting up late at night and scaring the shit out of myself. And then some nights I'd be asleep. My roommate, or sorry, my next door neighbor would sneak into my room and he'd play it at the end of my bed while I was sleeping. And sometimes I'd wake up and go, fuck, what are you doing in here? <laughs> He'd be smoking and playing fucking Doom in the middle of the night. Um... So I have really good memories of that game, and I've always wanted to find it again to play, but I could never find it for the right price. It was always seemed to be pretty high priced. So I had it here without even knowing it. So I played through Doom 1 first. I no had never played Doom 2. Um, so I played it after and beat it, and then finally I just beat Doom 3 the other day. So this was many months of work getting this done, but it was totally worth it because I love the Doom series. And as you know, I beat the Doom the 2016 version of the game for PS4 a while back. So um, all I got left now is Eternal. So the original Doom, the plots are pretty simple for those first two games. Uh, you're a, a soldier who's been stationed on Mars in the first game and uh, where they have been experimenting with teleportation and they basically teleport demons from hell uh, onto Mars and you've got to fight through the masses and whatever and, and, and destroy them all. Uh, in Doom 2, um, you return to Earth and find out that, oh shit, the invasion has reached Earth too. So then you got to free Earth from the invasion and eventually go to hell and face down the big bad boss. Um, these two games, very similar. Um, they basically just kept the same engine, the exact same graphics, exact same everything to do Doom 2 from what they did in Doom 1, just with different levels. Um, they added some different enemies. I think they added a couple extra dish, uh, different weapons from the first game. But basically, it was a carbon copy of the first game, and not in a bad way. Um, they just made the levels different and, and, and added a few new little things. But uh, it was awesome, uh, because both uh, the original Doom was awesome, and Doom 2 was just as awesome. Um, Doom 3, though, this one gets pretty serious. It was released in 2004, I think. And, uh, you know, the, the jump in graphics and gameplay from Doom 1 and Doom 2 to Doom 3 is, is very noticeable. Um, not that Doom 1 and Doom 2 are any less relevant or good than Doom 3. They're all good, but it's just such a difference uh, between the, the two. Um, and in this one, the story is a lot more in-depth, of course, because you got cinematics and 
people are talking and everything, right? So um, you, you are, again, a Marine, and it's kind of a reboot. It doesn't continue on. So you're a Marine who's been stationed on Mars for the UAC, which is the Union Aerospace Corporation. They are on Mars, again, experimenting with teleportation and whatnot, and they're led by this doctor named Malcolm Betruger. Only problem is he's gone completely batshit crazy, and he is teleporting uh, demons from hell uh, onto Mars and uh, you find this out the hard way and you got to battle through hordes and hordes and re go to hell and uh, and face down the big bad bosses right so um, very um, very different from the original Doom a lot more story driven um, but the, basically in essence the same type of game in the first Doom game, I found there was hordes of enemies and you'd just be moving and moving and moving and uh, and just having to face down all these hordes. In Doom 3, it's you don't get that those hordes coming all the time. It's more you're creeping through dark hallways and you got to face down a couple here and there, maybe 10. Um, but it's a lot more strategic and just, uh, okay, which weapon should I use here, whatever, you know, it's... Uh, a different vibe but at the same time being the same game in essence you know so but either way if you've never played any doom games um start with doom one and work your way up uh but play them all because they're so fun they, they can take a while to play through because there's a lot of levels and and uh it can get hard in parts and you gotta you can save as you go though that's the beauty about these games you can just you kill one enemy save you know like if, if you're in a hard spot um so it is possible to you know inch your way through uh but uh yeah fantastic games and really revolutionized video games back in the day like that was doom was a big game back in the day um and, and they've kept on releasing them um up till this day so last thing masters of reality this band was introduced to me by my buddy johnny who is a musician and, and knows everything about music and uh, he had it on in the car one day, and I was like, who the fuck is this? And uh, he said, Masters of Reality. And I was like, never heard of them. So they are a band that were formed in the early 80s in Syracuse, New York. And this is their debut album from 1989. Um, I don't even know if it has an official title. Um, I think it's just called Masters of Reality. This is actually a 1990 reissue that adds an additional track to the first disc, the studio disc, but then there's also the addition of a live uh, disc uh, where they did a session at the uh, the Viper uh, room or whatever. So um, this band is kind of all over the place. They uh, alternative, hard rock, blues, and uh, it really reminded me of like people who would like listening to like fish man right because you're super high like they would love this too it's kind of stone of rock as well it's a it's a whole bunch of things all melded into one and uh and 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 because of that it's you, it's you kind of go on this journey where you don't know what you're gonna get from song to song right you could be up here in this kind of spectrum on this song and then you're fucking way down here and then you're over here you know it's it's uh really really an interesting band and uh and this disc is um <clears throat> it's a masterpiece masterpieces of reality maybe they should be called but anyways i didn't look through the tracks before this but um john brown is the song that originally got me hooked on them that i heard in the car i was like okay so that's one of my faves the candy song is really good Doral dina's prophecies is really good um domino is really good yeah those are probably my favorites but but every every song on <clears throat> on this disc is fantastic and uh um kind of a a surprise little discovery there that Johnny helped me uh helped me along with and uh I listened to him pretty heavily over the last number of months so um anyways that is all I have for now uh, I'm sure I've gone over my time I'll see if I can get this damn thing posted or not and uh and I'll be back again in the near future with uh, a lot more bullshit so until then